Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to be talking about how the unsolicited participation of our unconscious makes free will impossible. Okay, um, before we begin, I want to just talk a bit about why I'm doing this show, what, what the relevance of this topic is to our lives, both personally and, um, and globally. Um, since civilization, before civilization, we've had this idea that um, what we decide, our moral decisions, every decision in our life is completely up to us. And this is what we refer to as free will, that our will or volition is free of factors, um, events, circumstances that, that would otherwise compel our um, behavior. And upon examination, as early as the Greeks, it's, it's kind of been understood um, rationally that, that this, this idea of a, of, of a will free of that is just, you know, basically impossible. Um, and, we'll, you know, we've gotten into that in various episodes. We'll get into that a bit more in this episode related to the unconscious. And... Um, and so that the alternative is that we have a causal will. Causal will means that our volition, what we decide, how we decide, our every action, thought, feeling, is caused. It's caused by something in the past. It's caused by um, our genes, our, um, our personality, our past learning, our upbringing, our experiences. <coughs> and in this case, the, uh, the unconscious. I'm, I'm laughing because, like, I just got back from... Um, from a break after having taken two um, taped two episodes earlier today, and <laughs> my decision, which I you know went into uh, in one of the shows, was whether to go to the library to browse through s um, some books on Egyptian art or to the mall and get some coffee. <laughs> and and the thing is, like, I actually did both. You know, I, I took a trip um, first. I was at the library, then I before coming back to the studio, I went to the to the mall for coffee. And the funny thing is that I don't. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> I don't um, drink caffeine. You know, I just don't uh, for whatever reason. And uh, but I decided, you know, I was feeling a bit tired, um, you know, earlier today. So I decided, well, you know, why don't I do this? And so like I'm, I'm noticing <laughs> as I'm talking, it's kind of, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the effects of the caffeine, which is really another kind of um, explanation, demonstration of, you know, my will not being free because you know. If I'm trying to talk in a way that wouldn't reflect that feeling or that effect of caffeine, it would be pretty impossible. Anyway, all right, so, so that's basically, you know, you know and, and the reason I'm doing the show is like because, you know, hopefully by transcending this illusion of free will, we can create a kinder world, a, a more compassionate and understanding world. The, the idea behind this is that, for example, let's say you have a toddler, okay, and a toddler let's say we'll do something wrong, you know, spill a glass or whatever, you know. And, you know, we, we, we say to ourselves, well, you know, the toddler couldn't have done any, known any better. You know, we don't blame the toddler. We, we hold the toddler innocent because, you know, because, you know, a toddler wouldn't know any better. They just, you know, they don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't ascribe free will to them. That's the thing, especially, you know, like, let's say a six-month-old or, you know, a younger um, infant. So because of that, we will treat that infant with much more understanding, much more compassion. And when we translate that same kind of way we treat that infant to others and to ourselves, you know, acknowledging that e even as adults, we don't have any more of a free will than the child did at, at six months, then we can um, create a world that's much more intelligent, much more understanding, much more compassionate. You know, and, and they're therefore much more pleasant, you know, for everyone. Okay. So, now this, in this episode, we're going to explore how, you know, our unconscious, we, we all have an unconscious, is constantly involved in every decision we make. You know, and we can't help it. It's like, its participation is unsolicited. We don't ask it to, to work. We don't even know, you know. <laughs> we can't, like... The reason we term it the unconscious is because we're not conscious of it. It works, and we, we've determined that we have one through various means, some of which I'll go 
into later in the program. But, um, but the idea is that this, yeah, this, this unconscious never sleeps. It's, it's always active. It's, it, it retains all our memories, um, what we've learned, just all, all our thoughts, just our experiences are, are retained in, in, in various um, neural networks. And, um, <laughs> and so, like, it is taking part in every decision we make. And um, before I get more into that, I want to just describe how, because it takes part in every decision, that, that would make free will impossible. And the idea is like, in science, in reason, there is this idea of causality, that, um, that nothing is uncaused. There's always, if something happens, there's, there's a reason why it happens. There's a cause or causes for it to happen. And there, then there's this principle within science and philosophy of unnecessary and sufficient cause. Uh, for example, okay, if I want to lift the table in front of me, I might like grab it with my right hand and, and lift it. Okay? So then the cause of that, um, the table rising would be, you know, my right hand lifting it, my right arm. But let's say I'm reaching <laughs> for it with my right arm and but I'm also reaching for it with my left and I, I lift it up with both arms and both hands. Okay? In that case I can no longer say that um, the right hand was the um, sufficient and necessary cause of it because the left hand was, was involved in the lifting. So it's actually a combination of these two causes, you know, that, that um, results in the table lifting. All right, so now apply this to our unconscious. Let's say my right arm and hand is our conscious mind. So it, it like, it decides, well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to decide to uh, lift this table, okay? But our left arm and hand is our unconscious. And again, we're not aware of it, but it's always active. It's always, it takes part in our every decision. And again, I'll, I'll get into it later. And, um, and even if it weren't, even if it weren't um, taking part in every single decision, we could never know, you know, with any degree of certainty whether it was partici participating in, in our decision or not. So what happens is like we have this unsolicited, unconscious participation. And so like if I, you know, if my conscious mind goes to lift the table and my unconscious mind is saying, well, wait a minute, um, I'm going to like take part in this. You know, I want to like, you know, I'm going to take part in the decision to, um, to lift the table. Or in some cases, it could be that like, actually, <laughs> we're going to do a show about this. In some cases, our conscious mind believes that it is making the decision to, to lift the table, whether with the right or left hand or whatever, but it's actually the unconscious mind that's making that decision. But the principle here, the principle here is that um, if, if, um, if the conscious mind and the unconscious are involved in the decision to lift the table and the lifting of the table, then we can no longer say that the, the decision was free, what was freely consciously made. Okay, you know, what was free of the, the participation in this case of the unconscious. Okay, and so, so that's the principle at play here. And, and again, you know, our unconscious never sleeps. And, you know, our consciousness, our conscious mind, when we're asleep, when we take a nap or something, we, um, it doesn't function. You know, what our dreams are all, are all on the level of the unconscious. I guess like they become conscious, you know, in our dreaming. But there, there's um, most of the time when we sleep, or a lot of the time at least, we're not sleep <laughs> dreaming. You know, we're, we're not in the dream state of sleep. We're in a state that like, you know, I don't know where we are, but, that, but the unconscious is also working there. So it's working while we're asleep and while we're awake. Okay? So now how, is, um, how does this play out um, in experience? How do we know this? Okay, how do we know that we have an unconscious? And how do we know that, that this unconscious is actually 
in many cases, making decisions uh, for us that we think our conscious mind is, um, is making. <laughs> One way is, is through hypnosis, and particularly the, the idea of a post-hypnotic suggestion. Now, hypnosis has been around for about 150 years, I think, um, maybe a, a bit less. And the idea is that, like, you can hypnotize a person, and when they're hypnotized, give them a post-hypnotic suggestion, meaning that, like, when they wake up, um, when they're not hypnotized anymore, you can, like, have them do something, you know? And, uh, in other words, while they're hypnotized, you tell them, in this case, for example, um, all right, when the phone rings, you're going to get up from your chair, <laughs> you're going to get on your knees, <laughs> and um, take, uh, crawl a couple of steps, and look at the carpet, okay? Or, or just not even, just, just take a couple of steps, okay? So, and they've, this is like, this isn't uh, fiction, this is fact. They've done this. So what happens? Um, so let, they do this, you know, they do this with a subject. They'll hypnotize the subject. Um, they'll give them the post-hypnotic suggestion that when the phone rings, the subject is going to um, get up from the chair and crawl on, on the carpet, you know? And so what happens in the actual experiment, that is what happens. You know, the, the, um, the hypnosis session is over, and, you know, the, the, the subject in, um, is talking to the experimenter, to the hypnotist. The phone rings, okay, and lo and behold, <laughs> the, the, uh, the subject will get down on their knees and, and maybe crawl a little, whatever, just, like, you know, fulfill the, the post-hypnotic suggestion. Now, how does re this relate to the idea of free will and, and you know, the, the unconscious mind really being this unsolicited participation in, in thoughts that we would otherwise be sure that they are, you know, are conscious, freely willed thoughts? Well, <laughs> what happens is then they ask, they ask the person, <laughs> why, um, why did you decide to um, get up from the chair and, um, or, or no, just, you know, the, the last person, what are you doing, you know? And the person will say something like, oh, I'm just like admiring, I mean, the, the pattern on this carpet is so beautiful. Or, or they might say, oh, I don't know, I just, I felt the need to stretch or something. The idea is like, they will, the, the subjects will make up, <laughs> you know, will guess, will make up a reason that they think is the real reason that they consciously chose to do that when the experimenter, and, and in fact, uh, the experimenter knows that it's because of the post-hypnotic suggestion to do that. Okay, so that's a perfect example of how the unconscious exists and, um, and is, um, is actually, in this case, completely. It's not as if it's participating in a conscious decision. It's actually making the decision for the person. Okay? Um, this is like, this is an, a really intriguing kind of area in, in research. Uh, John Barge from um, B-A-R-G-H, Barg maybe, from Yale University has, has done um, experiments on this.